is a place for people. People that need help, and that's all of us at one time or another. We need different kinds of help, maybe. God Tell is not primarily a place to give people a roof over their head and food to eat. God Tell is a place whereby we can tell people about Jesus Christ. God Tell is a school. It's my school. It's my wife's school. It's a place whereby we can learn how to minister to people, how to love people, sometimes people that are unlovable. And all the people that cooperate in this effort get to be part of what's going on at God Tell. Oh yeah, well it's Wednesday night, you know what that means. As soon as we leave here, we're heading for Livingston. Stay there for three days and then uh, Sunday we go back to Nacogdoches and start all over again. In case any of you are wondering where Joseph is, we kidnapped him. Took him to Nacogdoches, he's working up there for us now, right now. He's doing, it. He's doing all right, he's been there a week and he hasn't killed anybody yet. And nobody has killed him. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3. This is about relationships. Some of you are going to get it. Some of you are not going to want to get it. Some of you don't want to hear it. Some of the ladies won't want to hear it for sure. I've already been through that and uh, suffered through it and got the t-shirt anyway. <clears throat> Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without a word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, obviously, he's writing to Christians who should know how to act. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose anointing let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair, wearing of gold or putting on of apparel or tattoos and nose rings, whatever you want to call it. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the women, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel, being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, when we read this, I find even in the churches I've preached in all across half of the United States, I found out that most of them never read this. They don't know it's here. In fact, they don't want to read anything that has to do with submission or love and how to act because everybody wants to do what they want to do. But let me tell you a secret, and you may have already found out some of this and not known it. But here you are at God Tell, and probably every one of you in here has been in some kind of relationship that somehow got screwed up. And uh, the reason it got screwed up is because you and whoever you were having relationships with was not doing it God's way. You were doing what you wanted to do, and obviously now here you are. Well, you say, well, here we are, God Tell. What does this mean to us? Well, it means this. You may leave here one day and enter into another relationship. And I hope that when we go through these scriptures, you'll have enough knowledge so maybe the next time around you'll get it right. Wouldn't that be nice? If you're not willing to do that, do yourself a favor and the whole world a favor. Don't get in any more relationships. <coughs> You'd be better off, and the persons that you're going to ruin would be better off if you just stayed to yourself. Unless you want to do what God says. Now remember, I didn't write the Bible, but I did find out that especially when I met Nancy back 44 years ago, she was a women's liber. She thought the Apostle Paul was a male chauvinist pig. She told me. And she was not going to do what God said. But she was honest enough to seek God, and then God showed her what to do, and me also. And so we ended up staying together for 44 years so far. 
Now, if you want to, has it been 44? 44 long, 44 years. That's right. We're getting, we're getting old. Now, we both were married before. Nancy was married nine years. Didn't do it God's way. That got all screwed up. I was only married for a year and a half. And my first wife ran off with my best friend, whom his name is Robert. If I ever see him, I'm going to thank him. I'm going to shake his hand and say, bless you, my brother. Thank you. One of the best things that ever happened to me outside of becoming a Christian was not having that woman anymore. I was teenage love, you know. That doesn't always work out. So let's go back to verse 1 and look at this. Likewise, remember the previous chapter was talking about submission. Likewise, you wives. Obviously, he's talking to married women. Be in subjection to your own husbands. Now, folks, this is one reason why God was never in, had never intended for women to work outside the home. He intended for the women to raise the children. And if a woman wants a career, uh, a career that's, that's fine, but she really doesn't need a husband for that. But I'm going to tell you a story that's true. It happened to me. My dad, mom, there was three children in the family at that time. We were reasonably a happy family. We were just buying a new house. Of course, back in those days, a house that the same house that today would sell for half a million dollars sold for thirteen thousand in the 1950s. Same house. It's still there. It's been sold several times. And uh, <clears throat> my dad had a uh, we had a nice car, fairly new car. I think it was a year old. He had a decent job in a machine shop. He was a blue collar worker, but he made a respectable salary and was able to support everybody. But they got together somehow and decided that they needed more money. Well, the solution was for my mother to go to work, which meant us kids were home alone a lot. And my mother went and got a job as a key punch operator at the Bank of America. About a year later, she ran off with the vice president of the bank, left us. My dad destroyed our family, screwed everything up, and it's all because they were not doing it God's way. They were doing it, man, they were following what people said, oh, if both of you work, you'll have more money, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Yeah, they did, and it split the marriage up. I only saw my mother maybe four times from the time I was nine years old till I was 24. She did not want to acknowledge that I was her son. In fact, when I came, went to visit her, she made sure she let me know not to let anybody know that I was her son because she didn't want these people up there in Lake Tahoe where she was living, where she was now the president of the Bank of America branch there. She didn't want anybody to know that she'd had a previous family and all this stuff because she was a member of PTA and all this other stuff. And then here I show up. She's got two other kids by this man, Bill. But you know, my mother paid. She became the breadwinner in the family because Bill had a gambling problem and he couldn't keep a job. There's one thing after another, you know, drank. But she stayed with him. You know, he loved her. He worshipped her. And uh, she loved him and so they stayed together. Or at least they stayed together anyway. My mother died at age 42 of cancer. She weighed 50 pounds. Her husband, Bill, could not bear to be without her within a year after he gambled away everything they owned, including their house. He died. Two weeks after his, he died, Jimmy, one of my brothers, he died. The only one that was left was Kenny, and Kenny was had become a Christian, and Kenny's still alive. He's doing fine. In fact, he operates the um, trolley system that's up there at Lake Tahoe. He inherited that, I think, from his wife's dad. But he's doing fine. We don't have much of a relationship. I don't see him. You know, we send him Christmas cards. That's about it. But I'm pleased that he's doing okay. And the time I did visit with him, found out he was a Christian and everything was going smoothly. My mother died professing to be an atheist. So guess where she is tonight? I got a brother, Eli. That's my mother and I, uh, my mother's son also. There was three of us originally, then there was five more, and then there was two more. And there's, anyway, there's like, 
I don't know how many of us kids there was, but I was the oldest and best looking, I do know that. And my brother Eli's just been diagnosed with stage four cancer. He's younger than me, I, I was the oldest, and he's dying. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And if he dies, he's gonna probably be sitting in the seat next to my mother in hell. That's sad. He thinks we don't live in reality, that we're brainwashed. He's got it all figured out. And he's gonna die based on, uh, facing the future based on his opinions. I don't know why anybody would be so stupid as to enter into eternity based on what they think rather than trying to look for some information. Even if you were joined a false religion, at least you'd have some kind of hope. He has none. <clears throat> Tore the whole family up because of that. I grew up on the streets. Uh, my dad's life was ruined. I mean, totally ruined. He's still alive. He's 91. He remarried about 40 years ago or a little more. And he's been married to that same woman all these years. And um, I think he's scared of her. No. <laughs> so you're going to have to learn that there's two ways to do things. You can either do it God's way or you can follow society and do it man's way. And you've already done that and where's it gotten you? You know, here you are. Nothing wrong with being here if you take the opportunity to learn so that when you do leave here, you don't make the same mistakes all over again. Before this is over, I'm going to tell you guys how to treat a woman. That'll help. But you women, first of all, are to be in subjection to who? Your own husbands. And the problem is when you go to work somewhere else, if you're married, you end up being in subjection to some other man. That's the problem. That's what happened. <clears throat> and that if you're a Christian woman, even without, you got, and you got this man, he's not a Christian, he's not doing right, but you can win him without saying anything if he watches your behavior. I tell this to people all the time in counseling. Most of them don't listen to me. Children do not learn what they're told. Children learn what they see you do. That's what they learn. All the good words in the world, if you're not living them yourself and you're a hypocrite, all those good words will not teach them anything. They're going to want to do what they see you do. While, verse 2, they behold your chaste conversation, that's behavior, coupled with fear. Fear of what? Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge, understanding. And then he tells the women how they ought to be acting. Because actions speak louder than words. Don't have a beautiful showroom and nothing in the warehouse. A lot of women that I've run into in my lifetime who look really good on the outside, and then when they open their mouth and the garbage from their heart comes out, you find out they're a witch. If you guys haven't run into those ladies yet, you have not lived. Of course, there's none of these here. You know, It might be the ones that were here last week. but And some people, that's all they've got is what's on the outside. Now, folks, I don't mean to be ugly, but I want to be honest with you because I want you to learn some things. I get really irritated when I'm walking through the mall or someplace, and here comes a woman... She weighs 300 pounds. You know, overweight seems to be the thing today, and I have a problem with that myself. I keep trying not to eat so much. Um, I have lost some weight, finally. But I'll see this one, and she's wearing short shorts. This is a bad picture already, isn't it? And she's got cellulite hanging out all over the back of her legs, but she has a tattoo. <laughs> And I guess she wants everybody to see it. Maybe she thinks she looks pretty with it. I've never seen a woman that looked pretty with a tattoo. Ladies, if you have them, you can't get rid of them, but don't expect me to go, ah. Oh. When I grew up, there was not one woman in Los Angeles that I knew that had a tattoo. Not one. Nobody had these funny little rings in their ears making a big hole. And nose rings. You know? People think... And I think a lot of people don't like themselves, so they do all this stuff to try to improve what God made. You need to learn that what God made is fine. 
Well, you can be the best you you can be. I have met people who are white that wanted to be black. I've met people that were black that wanted to be white. I've met Mexicans, we're just happy to be Mexicans. <laughs> you know, I, 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 get, I get really fl frustrated when I go into a church to preach and the young people especially come into the church and they're all wearing flip flops and shorts in church. No respect, no concept of trying to do right, look right, and they talk just like they look. Foul stuff comes out of their mouth. And they don't think anything of it. Too much television, I guess. We want to imitate the world. Well, that's what the children of Israel did. They wanted to imitate the nations around them and have a king and everything. And every time they did that, God had to destroy them. And that's what's going to happen to America. We have an attitude that we're superior to God. We have got it all figured out. We're going to do what we want to do. But folks, what you don't realize is that there's coming a payday. And you're not going to like it. You're going to wish, oh, I should have done something about this. Now, you can't undo what you've already done. I'm not suggesting you even try. But what I am telling you this, since you can't change the past, try to do something about what's coming, the future. Do something better with that. All of us have done stupid things in the past. All of us have sinned and we've all done things we shouldn't have done and we can't undo any of them. There's a lot of things. Man, if I could go back, there's a billion things I'd change. I, they, I always laugh at these people and say, well, if I went back, I wouldn't change anything. I think they're just being liars. There are a lot of things I'd change. First, I'd have met my wife five years earlier or nine or ten. <clears throat> don't let just the outward appearance define you now folks I'm not against women wearing makeup or anything you know there's some Pentecostals that are I heard one preacher say one time Pentecostal preacher he said it's a sin for women to wear makeup I happened to be talking to a Baptist preacher who said it's a sin for some women not to wear makeup <laughs> I said amen brother <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. It's this overzealous producing of things in your life to try to make you look like something you're not because you don't like who you are. <clears throat> now, I want to take your Bible and I want to read some verses to you and I want you to turn to them because you're not going to believe they're even in here. Let's try starting with 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, folks, remember, I didn't write this. I didn't say I liked all of it either, I don't. But I'm going to do what it says. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof we wrote unto, you wrote unto me, it's good for a man that he not touch a woman. Now he's talking there about a single man. It's better that he don't touch a woman. It's kind of like drinking. Best way not to get drunk is what? Okay. Don't drink. So the best way not to be tempted to lust if you're not married is Leave the women alone. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, if you're married, obviously, and the wife have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. He's talking about sex. This is King James English. They worded things kind of strange. There's nothing wrong with sex inside of marriage. There's a lot of things wrong with it outside of marriage. Let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband has not power over his own body, but the wife. Defraud not, don't withhold your affections. Defraud not one another, except it be, for this one reason, with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. That's the only reason. And then, it says, come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. Let's turn to chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> Starting in, uh, well, we'll start with uh, verse 3. It's hard to get these down. I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. 
So far, so good. Here's where the problem comes in. The head of the woman is the man. Did you know that was in the Bible? These people say, oh, men and women are equal. They're not. We are different. You ladies over there have a specific function in life that God granted you and me as a man, a specific function, and the two of us are different. Y'all do know that, right? Some people don't. That's why two men are trying to get married and two women are trying to get married. They don't know there's a difference. I've known that there's a difference between men and women since I was five years old when I saw that little blonde girl across the street and I went over and started singing to her. I did. She swooned. She thought I was it. Of course, then her family moved away and I didn't get to see her anymore. Listen to this. The head of Christ is God. He is God, but so we can understand. Every man praying or prophesying having his head covered dishonors his head, dishonors Christ. And yet the Jewish people run around with these little yarmulkes on their head, and God says, no, don't do that. The Muslims, they got their little hat they wear when they pray. God says, don't do that. That's why in Western civilization, the Christian people, you'd see them, oh, the old timers especially, we go to pray, we take off our hats. We go to eat a meal and say grace, we take off our hats. We st I still do that. And I get irritated with people that call themselves Christians that pray with their hat because they're dishonoring God. That's what it says right here. But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. That would be me and her. For that is even all as if she were shaven. Now, in the old days, when they caught a prostitute, they shaved her head. That way everybody in town knew she was a prostitute. For the woman, if she's not covered, let her be shorn. But if it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. It was the sign of the harlot or someone caught in adultery. Now listen carefully. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Did you see that? But the woman is the glory of the man. I bet you didn't know that was in the Bible. God created man in his own image. He created man out of the dirt of the ground. And then he said, it's not good for man to be alone, so he made him a helper, and that was Eve. He opened up his side, he took out a rib, and made Eve out of a dirty old man. All right, you asked for it. <laughs> you know, most people, they say, oh no, men and women are equal. We're not the same. We're just not the same. We're not supposed to be the same. I have never met a man who made a good woman. I've never met a woman that made a good man, although there's a couple I've met that were questionable. And I didn't want to meet them in a dark alley. The man is created in the image and glory of God. The woman is the glory of the man. Listen, it gets better. The man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Listen carefully. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Are you all following along here? See that I'm telling you the truth. For this cause ought women to have power on her head. That means a covering. Now there's two kinds of covering. And it goes on to explain this. Her hair and her husband. Because we are the spiritual leaders in our household. Supposed to be. Most men are not. Some of you didn't. That's why you're in the trouble you're in. Because uh, that is a, a, a invisible spiritual umbrella over the wife. <clears throat> For this cause ought women to have power on her head because of the angels. Now the single women, when they came to church in the early Christian church, they all wore hats because they didn't have a covering, because they didn't have a husband. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of man, even so the man also came by woman. In other words, I had a mommy. She wasn't a very good one, but I had one. All things are God. Judging yourselves, is it calmly or is it right that a woman should pray with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. 
for her hair is given to her as a covering. Now, let's go back. Well, let's go to Ephesians quickly. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. That's the Apostle Paul. 5.22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as unto the Lord. How are the wives supposed to submit to the husband? Just like as if they were submitting to who? To God. I suppose you didn't see that in the Bible either. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in what? Everything. Everything. Oh, my goodness. Marriage is not 50-50. This is where a lot of people get a mis make a mistake. They say, yeah, it's 50-50. No, no, it's not. It's 100% and 100%. In a marriage... It, there has got to be a lot of dying to self. We don't always get to do what we want to do. And we're going to get to the husbands in just a second. So girls, don't despair. But it's not 50-50. It's 100% and 100%. Verse 25. Husbands, men, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. When Jesus gave himself to pay the penalty for our sin, did he give 50%? No, he gave 100%, didn't he? He died and paid the penalty for your sin. He gave all that he had, and that's what we're supposed to do for the wife. Now, folks, guys, let me tell you a secret. You cannot make a woman <coughs> submit to you. Now, you can beat her up, but she might kill you later when you're asleep. You cannot make her submit, but you can love her like Christ loved the church, and she will want to submit. I don't have to try to make my wife do anything. All I got to do is treat her right. If I treat her right, she's putty in my hands. She didn't have any trouble submitting to me, to my authority. And see, in a, in a Christian family, the husband is where the buck stops. If we make decisions in our family and she gives me information, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, I use it, I don't use it. Ultimately, if there's a problem with it, whatever we're going to do, God comes to me. He doesn't ever talk to her. I'm the one where the buck stops. So I try real hard to listen to what she has to say because it might be good. And sometimes it is. Once, twice, no. <laughs> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. Happy wife, happy life. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And of course, Jesus is talking about the church. Go back to uh, 1 Peter now where we were when we started, and we'll finish it up. If you want to have a relationship, and this is what happened to us, our, two, our first two relationships, we screwed up. When Nancy and I got married, our church fortunately was going through a phase where they were offering classes on parenting and on husband-wife relationships. We took all the classes, we got the books, we read the books, we sought God in His Word, even though we didn't always get along and agree on everything. We both had decided we were going to do it God's way. And that's why we're still together. It's different with Martin and Mary. Mary just tells Martin what to do, and he says, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and if you believe that, i got a bridge in Arizona I will sell you. <laughs> so when the husband says, honey, I think, and this is stupid, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I think we need to go to Florida for vacation. She says, well, I want to go to Colorado. Well, yeah, but I prayed, and the Lord has shown me we need to go to Florida. I'm not sure why, but we need to go to Florida for vacation. And the wife says, but I'm going to Colorado. And then the husband says, well, I'm going to Florida. Well, I'm going to Colorado. So they go two different directions, right? Now, how in the world is the husband supposed to be the caretaker of the wife if she's in Colorado and he's in Florida? In a Christian wedding or marriage, the husband's decision is final and everybody's supposed to get on board. 
That's the way it's supposed to work. So we go to Florida. Now, if we were supposed to be in Colorado, but we, but because I'm pig-headed, you know, we went to Florida instead. Well, God's going to get me for that. And I will probably look at Nancy one day and say, we should have went to Colorado. That's if I would made a mistake. We maybe should be in Florida, so then that's okay. I said that's a silly illustration, but, you know, I, I know a lot of people, husbands and wife, who take separate vacations. One goes one way, one goes the other way. That ain't right. I'm supposed to be the protector of my wife. I can't protect her if she's somewhere I'm not. That's why my wife and I for 44 years have not been anywhere unless the other one's there or I have made arrangements for somebody to be with her, help her out, whatever. And that's only been maybe once when Martin drug me off to West Texas to pick up one of his cars. We weren't gone very long, were we, Martin? We just went and got it and came back, didn't we? Yeah. That wasn't gone very long. But other than that, we've never been apart. She works, but she works for me, which has definite advantages. She's my secretary, and I can chase her around the office, and nobody can say anything. <laughs> it's pretty cool. The women, my wife did this. It says here, the women of old, the holy women trusted God. Even a Sarah, like she called Abraham Lord. One time my wife was at church and she called me Lord. And the ladies around her got upset. And another time, because she was trying to make a point, I didn't want her to do this, but she did. She bent over and kissed my shoe. And the women got upset. We're not going to do that. And you know, some of those women aren't married anymore. My wife wasn't in any way, because I love my wife. I'm not going to make her kiss my shoe. But the point is, she was making a point to those ladies about submission. And they didn't get it. And that's sad. <clears throat> and, of course, Sarah feared the Lord. That's what they're talking about here. Likewise, you husbands... Likewise means by the same token. Dwell with them according to what? <coughs> Knowledge, understanding, right. Giving honor to the wife as the, weak, the wife is the weaker vessel. Now I think some of you women probably think you're as tough as a man, but you know those, that's because you've been watching too many movies and you got this little 90 pound karate girl whipping five guys that weigh 250 pounds a piece. That's a bunch of hogwash. It doesn't work that way. Some of those girls can beat on a man all day long and he'll just laugh at her. It's just silly. But we put that image because, you know, in the media, we're trying to make it look like men and women are equal. That's what the media is doing. A woman cannot carry the same weights that a man, even the women that do weightlifting. They can't carry the same weight or lift the same weight as a man of comparable size. Our muscles are different, did you know that? Men's muscles get bigger. The only way you can get a woman's muscles bigger usually is steroids, and then they still don't respond the same way. <clears throat> you gotta understand, when he says the woman is the weaker vessel, she is. Men operate from a the concept in her mind is logic. A woman operates, the concept in her mind is emotionalism. That's why when you're driving down the street, and it looks like you're going to have a fender bender, the woman goes, look out! The man goes, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> Y'all didn't know that, did you? That's a little over-dramatized, but you get the idea. It's different. My wife, she's always going, oh, watch out, watch out. I said, honey, calm down. Just, it'd be all right. We had a wreck one time. And we had a limo years ago, and uh, we'd restored it. And anyway, I was coming down towards Lufkin, and I crossed the river where those liquor stores are, and a lady pulled out right in front of me. And my wife's going, oh, I said, I put my hand on her. I said, it's all right. Boom. That's right. She was there. She can tell you. I was calm. She was excited. Because women and men are different. When I recognize there's something going to happen that I can't do anything about, I just relax. She always thinks there's a way out. 
she'll grip the dashboard so hard her she melts her wedding ring. I mean, it's just amazing, you know. Fingers turn all blue and pink and purple. I'm going, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> I don't have a beer, but that's what I would say if I had one. Guys, here's the secret I'm going to tell you. You women don't have to listen if you don't want to, but I'm going to tell the men a secret. If you enter into a relationship with a woman and you want her to stay with you, treat her like a queen. A man came in our mission. He was black. His girlfriend was white. I grew up in Los Angeles. That didn't bother me. What bothered me was the way he treated her. He walked in and he said, hey, Brother June, this is my woman. I said, what? He said, this is my woman. I said, you want this woman to stay with you? He said, yeah. I said, then why don't you treat her like a woman instead of baggage? You know that man never did tell me that woman's name? It's hard to respect somebody like that. And I'm sure she didn't stay very long. Women get tired of that real fast. Being treated like secondhand rose wearing secondhand clothes. My woman. You know, I, I, I appreciate it. I'm in the store, I meet somebody, they got their wife with them, they say, uh, Brother June, I'd like you to meet my wife, Betty. You know, we shake hands. Hi, how do you do? It's good to meet you. Pleasantries. But you know, a lot of people don't do that anymore. I've met people, you can stand there for three hours and they'll never introduce their partner to me. Wife, girlfriend, whatever, fiance. Of course, everybody's got a fiance these days. And God tells no place to find one. I'm telling you the truth. Everybody here has got problems. Why do you think we're all here? I had a guy and a girl. I think the girl checked in first in Nacogdoches. And I think the next day the guy sh showed up and he checked in. They had never met before. On the third day, they introduced themselves to me as their fiance. Two weeks later, they divorced, yeah, <laughs> split up. And the next day after that, this woman introduced me to her new fiance. You know, I like to go have their brains checked. But I'm afraid if we did an x-ray, we wouldn't find anything. It's ridiculous. And I've seen so many people hook up at God Tell. I got another one, Jerry, and uh, some woman he hooked up with at God Tell. And, and I don't know how long that's going to last. But, you know, it, I've watched them come and go and come and go. Forty years of it. And it's just totally ridiculous. This is not the place to be hooking up. If you want to meet somebody that's worth having, start going to church. And start acting like you're supposed to. And you just might find a Christian guy or a Christian woman that really has got themselves on the ball with the Lord, and you might could have a good relationship. If my wife was ever to die, you think I'd hang around here? Uh-uh. I go to church. In fact, I told my wife, we were uh, reading a newspaper one day in Livingston. <laughs> and they had a picture on the front of this senior citizen class from First Baptist Church. They were going on an outing. I'm a senior. There was two men and 20 women in the picture. Because all the other husbands had died off. And I looked at my wife and I said, honey, if you ever die, I'm going to enroll in that Sunday school class. <laughs> well, yeah. I ain't going to go looking for a woman in a bar. What kind of woman are you going to get in a bar? What kind of man are you going to get in a bar? A drunk? But boy, I've watched people do that for years. They show no sense at all. And then when the thing goes bust, they're whining. And of course, it's always the other person's fault. You ever notice that? The men blame the women, the women blame the men. And I try to stay out of the middle of it. Because I can't win. <laughs> Folks, it's very important. There's a, this is just a, a very small 
amount of scripture about relationships with husbands and wives, you need to study the Bible. You'll be miles ahead if you know how to act and make the right choices. Also, there's a lot of information here about, about employers and employees and how to act. There's a lot of information in here about eating and drinking and all. It, it's all in there. Most people just don't want it. Father, we thank you for loving us, and I do thank you for each one in this room. I'm very grateful that they were here and that they've heard what your word has to say. And I know some of them have been through some horrendous experiences, terrible experiences, maybe didn't even know why they had the experiences they had, trying to figure it out. There's really nothing to figure out. It's a matter of did we do it God's way or not. If you want to have a relationship worth having, you'll do it God's way. That means men won't be out fooling around. They'll be treating their wives like they're supposed to. And the wives will be treating their husbands like they're supposed to. Instead of getting out in public like I've seen so many women do and nag the poor guy to death till he finally wants to leave. And I've heard men in counseling when they say, the wife says, he's cheating on me. And I look at the man and say, is that right? And he says, yes. I said, why? He says, she won't let me touch her. Well, that's a good reason. It's not right, but at least it's understandable. And sometimes I've seen it the other way around. It's just amazing to me that we just don't want to submit, first of all, to God. And then, as I said in the previous chapter, to one another. Maybe somebody will see it tonight. We thank you for our Lord Jesus and the salvation he's provided for us. We're thankful that he rose from the dead. Especially thankful that he promised to return. And every day we get up looking and hoping that the coming of Christ will happen now. We don't know the day or the hour, but we keep hoping. We thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.